everybody. Welcome to today's administrative committee meeting. My name is Sandra Kelly. With me is Maureen Laughlin and Gina Trusio wow. and City Supervisor Gary Reedner and his glasses that he is loaning me while uh, we do this today. Uh, first thing on the agenda, as always, is the approval of the August 9th, 2021 minutes. Looked good to me. Looks good to me. Great. Um, passed. Now we have something I think we're all looking forward to is the Moscow Oktoberfest alcohol use request and entertainment district. So Amanda Argona, come on over and uh, let's visit. How do you say it? I was trying, I, I practiced that today. All day I practiced that. Moscoberfest. Moscoberfest. Okay. So, good afternoon, Administrative Committee, Council Members, and Gary. Um, what is before you today is a draft resolution of um, requesting alcohol use in the recently formed entertainment district for Moscoberfest. Um, the applicant is the Moscow Chamber of Commerce, and this would be an inaugural event held on Saturday, October 2nd from 4 to 8 p.m. on Main Street between 3rd and 5th. You'll notice on the map there's a little squiggle line. Um, that's just to denote that 5th Street would actually remain open. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they have followed all these standard operating procedures, have submitted um, the required documentation, and the event has been reviewed and approved by the six different um, city departments and divisions that uh, these applications are routed through. And so uh, before you is a recommended approval of the resolution allowing for a temporary suspension of the open container law within the event footprint specifically for Moscoberfest for the duration of the event. Um, and I'd be happy to chat with you at the table if you have further questions about it. I do have a few. Yep questions for you I, I wanted just some clarification if you would on the squiggly lines that means that it will be open but that is part of the yeah that is just for that night that that's a typo essentially oh, okay. the squiggly line so it could even be a whiteout <laughs> yes. kind of a moment yes All and right. this map um, so with any event, um, especially ones with alcohol, the maps are always in flux and the applicant sure. has uh, ability to change them. So you'll see some boxes in the event footprint. That's not necessarily exact um, locations of where they anticipate um, their vendors being, but the focus for today is just the actual event footprint. Um, but the inf information that you had in there that talked about how many booths you're gonna be in food and food and alcohol and beer. And so the question is those, is that the number capped or they, is that flexible? That is what the applicant has requested as part of their event application. So that's what um, they have put down and it would be at this uh, body or city council body to cap that if they so felt. Amanda, a couple of the questions I have. Um, well, in general, I've been really excited about this as things have progressed COVID wise, even here at the city with having a scare downstairs. Um, I know the Vandal Block Party was recently canceled. Um, I know Farmer's Market is still going on. I, 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 would, I would just like, I don't know if I want to ask you or our folks that are visiting to, to just address some of those issues because I do think we are in a weird spot right now with, with how COVID's progressing and should we or should we not be doing things like this? So I'd just love to get your take on things. You know, I defer to Gary sure. about that, um, especially just because my role in this is um, putting forward the alcohol use request for the right. event. And, um, and so our office is continuing to accept applications and route those accordingly. We had several events this last Saturday and we have several more coming up um, through the rest of the year, so. Thank you. Yeah, the events that you've seen canceled, the um, downtown block party, mm -hmm. the, uh, um, gosh, what is it? Um, third Thursday event. And that's still going, I believe, with some COVID precautions. Yep. But mm -hmm. those are things that we are sponsoring. So we can cancel those. We have control over farmer's market, those sorts of things. What we've typically done is any, whatever we had to do to comply with North Central Health District or the governor's phased approach to COVID, that is what we passed on to uh, participants in downtown activities. If we have a licensing piece, the council can certainly have um, discretion over whether they want to issue those licenses or not right now we have no restrictions other than you know the recommendations to maintain social distance and those sorts of things so if it gets to the point where it presents a greater risk to public health then we'll address it at that time and i think any permittee from the city 
understands that if those circumstances change, that permit can be revoked for those reasons. And what is, like, what's yeah. our line on that? I just don't remember anymore. Like, when we're like, oh, it's too much, metrics. we're done. What are the metrics, metrics. on that? Again, it depends on what the issuance is out of North Central Health District, the governor's office, and from this council or the mayor. As you recall, last time we had the mayor's emergency order, we had uh, the phased approach to the governor's COVID response, and we had the recommendations from North Central Health District. Right now, right. none of those were still in phase four under the Idaho Rebounds Plan. Um, CDC has put out their recommendations for uh, social distancing if you're not vaccinated, those sorts of things. And we have no current emergency order issued by the mayor or ratified by the city council by resolution. If we were looking at our, our metrics from before, um, where we had, we had our different, it was like our, I thought of it as our color code, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Um, do you know where we're sitting at? I mean, I just haven't looked at that today and I'm sorry. And I have not, okay. we've not done that. Um, we could certainly, just for the purposes of research, we could look into that and I can, I can do that and share that with the council if you'd like. I, my, my main concern, well, I'm super excited about this and I love to be downtown and I love to do all of those things, right, that go with this. Um, I just wanna make sure that we're not being so excited to get outside again that we're missing sure. things. And so I just wanna have in place a way to be able to say, here's where we are and if we get to here, we can't do it. Right, not just this, but really any event we're at, whether it's a trick or treating or, or whatever. I'm just, I, I just feel that we need to have something set up. I don't know if it's that old metric that we used, well, or how it, to go about it. Yeah, it will require action by the mayor and or the city council to do that. If you want to put a metric in place or say, okay, now we're to the point where we're uncomfortable with it, so uh, we'd have to look into that. Again, it would have to be something to address the the risk as assessed at that moment and currently we don't right. have anything in place that right. addresses that but i guess i, I guess what I'm, i think i hear <clears throat> sandra saying is is that we can say that if is there some type of on what basis would we make that decision that becomes the real question and would we use the same metrics we have we used in the past to decide no we're not going to have this event um or would we create a different one because I think our numbers now are higher than when and I, most of the time. And I cannot say um, what that would be. Again, I've not looked at those metrics in recent history, right. so we probably need to do that. But again, when someone comes, pulls a permit from the city, they are pulling the permit based on the situation and the laws and regulations in right. place at that time. Should something pose such a risk that council and or the mayor decide that they need to do something out of sequence, then all of those permits are reviewable at that time based on those exigent circumstances. And I think the only thing we're asked that I think I heard was, is there some type of metrics again that we're going to use versus, oh my gosh, this many people <clears throat> died and this many people got tested at this and, and tested positive. And so that's really the question on that. Yeah. And what do our institutional partners say? Yeah. I think that was kind of the whole collab. Why don't you give us a chance to take a look at that? Okay. Yeah. But certainly we're not prepared today to right. ask for no. any recommendations. We're not asking for it. Okay. And I'm hoping that it will show us that we're good, right? Because it's not, I'm looking at this as a way to tell folks that, you know what, we're in a good spot to be able to do this rather than, oh my gosh, things are horribly out of control because we want to keep moving along and progressing, but we just want to make sure we're being safe. I guess with that, I would ask, does the council have any concerns with the resolution and the proposal before nope. you today? No, no. Okay. So we'll, shall we put that on the consent agenda? I think consent is yes. just fine with that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Amanda. Oh, I'm already on the wrong agenda. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving along. Uh, professional services amended agreement for our alternative water supply project. Mr. Tyler Palmer. Ladies, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, this is an amendment to. One moment. Yeah. yeah dog emergency. Come here. Come here. She's such a big Good. Down. Okay, we're done. All right. Thanks, Tyler. <laughs> okay. Carrying out. So this is an amendment to the professional services agreement for the Palouse groundwater basin alternative water supply 
study that we are engaged in. Um, the council will recall that this is a, a contract that we are administering on behalf of PBAC mm -hmm. um, with Alta Science and Engineering, which is a firm that's based here in Moscow. Uh, the, the contract is to continue on the work that was completed in 2017 that identified the four primary alternative water supplies projects that uh, could provide water for our 50 year demand horizon, accounting for growth and also for a percentage that would, uh, that, that's the estimated percentage for stabilizing the aquifer. Um, so this is really exciting work. It's something that we're super happy to be, to be continuing on the path to identifying an alternate supply project and working toward implementing that project. And so this is the work that's happening there. This, the original contract for $149,995 runs through the end of this year. In that contract, it was anticipated that through the process of working through the data gaps on the alternatives, that we would identify additional data gaps. That was something that was anticipated in the original contract, and this is the first of those that we've identified. And so we're back before council. This went to PBAC on August 19th and was approved. I do have to apologize. There is a typo on the date in there. We're not going back in time for this <laughs> extension, uh, and that'll be corrected for council. This is it's 20, the end of March of 2022 would be the, what this extension would do. Um, what happened was as they were working through with, the, uh, with DOE in the state of Washington, um, they identified that fisheries would be very important for us to be mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. to as we work through these processes. And so it includes some work with fisheries and then it also includes some work to, to, to kind of better hammer out the operations and, and maintenance costs for two of the alternatives, alternative one and alternative two. And so that's what this extension is. Um, so uh, we're, we don't have any concerns with this. As I said, it was passed by PBAC, but since the city of Moscow is administering the contract, it needs to go through Moscow City Council. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Did anything weird come up with fisheries? No, nothing weird, just that, that it is something that we've got to work through, that it's, you know, we, we had the identified things that we knew we needed to do, looking at water rights, looking at feasibility, looking at constructability, updated cost estimates, all of the different things, working with the tribes, et cetera. Um, and fisheries was one that wasn't in that original scope that as we started working through with the regulatory agencies, they just said, yeah, it's going to be important to whatever the alternative is, that it's something that fisheries can get on board with. When, when do we get to hear about it again? So that's really exciting. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> Councilwoman Terusio. Uh, on Wednesday evening of this week, so uh, two days, we have uh, a leadership roundtable that will be held and so that will include leadership from all the major pumpers in the basin, Washington State University, the University of Idaho, City of Moscow, City of Pullman. Uh, at that meeting there will be a presentation given by Alta on the progress that's been made on this and then just some general information about where we're at and we'll be able to field questions from all of the leadership from the different entities and organizations at that meeting. Um, we will also be having the water summit. The water summit is on October 21st. And that's our annual water summit that's held over at Schweitzer Engineering. Um, and so excited about that. That's another opportunity for us. We will be giving a ge the general basin update, the pumping numbers, the annual pumping numbers. And then Alta will also be giving a presentation that's open to the general public that, that, at that water summit. Um, and then we will continue to have ramped up public outreach. We have, we have a technical advisory committee that is working on this project um, that's been formed um, and we'll continue to have robust public, public outreach. There's a, a survey that is gonna be going out to the general public in the coming weeks. So yeah, there'll be continued work to try and help get the word out and gather information as well. For me. Mm -hmm. Tyler, will adding this fisheries piece to this contract Will that extend the preparation and submittal of the preferred alternatives that Alta will be giving to uh, PBAC and, and the entities? Yes, yes. So it'll delay it from December to? From December to March, the end of okay. March of 2022. Thank you. Okay. That's correct. <clears throat> Any other questions? I just, I think yeah. I want to ask this question again, and that is, and in, the, in one of those summits, and some presentation, are we going to talk about, is it going to be solely focused on one of the four alternatives or will it also talk about conservation issues? Conservation is included in all of the four alternatives. Conservation has to be a big part of our focus. Um, this is something, you know, when, when, we, when we talk about these alternatives, 
we're not talking, no alternative for a water supply ever is in perpetuity. It, it's, got, it's got a timeline horizon on it. And so conservation becomes terribly important. Even though we can't conserve our way out of our water issues, a 50-year solution could become a 70-year solution, could become a 100-year solution, and could save all of our ratepayers enormous amounts of money if we conserve. And so conservation is a big component of all these and will be ramping up at its importance as we move forward. Yeah, I, I do think that we're going to run into just as kind of a heads up on that, as everybody probably knows, that when the rates start going up, that people will all blame it on the annexations. That's just, I mean, I just want to be clear on that mm -hmm. so that somehow in the process of that, we've got to prepare people for that it's going to, we're going to have conservation issues regardless of whether or not we have annexations, but we really have to address that issue much better than we have in the past. I, I think you're right, uh, Maureen. We, we, we use, we currently, when, when the groundwater management plan was established in 1992, we, 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 there was 35% less population than we have in the basin right now, and we currently use 14% less water than when it was established in 92. Mm -hmm. So despite a 35% growth in population, we're using less water than we were in 1992 by 14%. So it's, it's pretty marked, and, and so it's, it's a real tribute to the success of the conservation right. programs. Right. Yes. We're declining at a slower rate, which is a wonderful thing, but the, so the, 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 the fact of the matter is we really have to have an alternative, even if we, even if we just cut everything off, build a wall around the entire basin and said nobody ever comes in ever again, we'd still have to find an alternate supply. Mm -hmm. I, totally. And, and I think we need to continue articulating that position. Maureen, I need a, a, to clarify. Do you, when you said annexations, did you mean subdivisions? I, I'm talking about... Or just the annexations? I mean... All, all increased... Yeah, I'm um, hearing it across the board, not yes, just yes. about the... Yeah, it's not just annexations. It's across everything because but that issue seems to keep coming up and your statement was very helpful in being yeah. informative mm -hmm. in that process. Whatever the development happens to be, we need to talk about how that all, how it fits into the pieces of the puzzle. Because without that, people feel like they're drowned out mm -hmm. and they're not being heard. Great. Thank you for the clarification on that, <laughs> Gina. All right, so I'm looking at this and the proposed action is to recommend approval for the proposed amended agreement, the alternative water supply project. Senator Jenner. Consent. Yeah, just in, in care for the long agenda we're going to have, yeah. but man, I'm, I'm telling you, there's some demand out there for the information. Yep. Yes. Very high. You know this. Mm -hmm. But I think that what's really helpful is, that, and how do we get that information out, is that we have a timeline now that says, okay, this is what this is, this one's going to happen here. In March, at the end of March, we should probably, we should have it, assuming everything goes smoothly with the fishery things. So anyways, that's my own sense of it, and that's why I thought articulation of that would be helpful. Yeah, and maintaining a little bit of a historic context with mm -hmm. it for this, I think it is important to remember that we've known that we had a declining aquifer mm -hmm. since the aquifers were first tapped in the late 1800s. This is something that there's been s some serious efforts over decades and decades at solving. And so for me, it's a really exciting time. We don't run the risk of short-term shortages. It's important no. that people understand that. I'm not trying to minimize the importance of this work, but, but we're not in a, in a Cape Town situation where we're saying, hey, there's a day zero for when we're shutting off the taps. That's not where we're at. But it is a very important thing to solve. So this is historic. I, I really feel like we're closer to a solution on this problem than we've ever been in the over 100 years that we've known we had a problem. Thank you very much. I think that is a good assurance. Madam Chair, I have something I would like to add to that because in two days we are going to have a mm -hmm. PBAC roundtable at the Best Western for two hours, <clears throat> as Tyler mentioned, and all the various leaders from all these entities are going to be there. And so what we need to do is we're going to be talking about these things and we need a press release afterwards mm -hmm. for right. what was discussed, when the water summit is, and yes, in fact, this is. And with your point, uh, Tyler, about look at since this thing started in '92, and we've had 35% increase in population and a 19% or 18 14% decrease. Those numbers and those types of things need to get out to everyone, and it needs to be put in a paper. It needs to be put on our website. It needs to be put on the city of Pullman's website, and we need to make a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. So with that, just I wanted to add that in there. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, did you have something? Oh, you're taking a. Taking let me out. take. Give you your glasses, Taylor, though. All right. Chip thank you. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Bill will handle the rest of it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>
Are you willing to give up your glasses and the? <laughs> we'll take. I'll take over before we have to give the glasses on this one. Here we go. No All right. Affordable cares. housing grant program proposal by Mr. Bill Belknap. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, as council is aware, during the development of the FY22 budget, the city council appropriated uh, 30,000 in funding to be utilized to promote the development of affordable housing within the community. Uh, that budget actually started with the mayor's uh, budget of 50,000 and then 20,000 was reallocated to climate change uh, measures. And so what was left in the budget that was passed by the council was 30,000 for that effort. Uh, prior to the adoption of the budget, uh, staff met with uh, our local affordable housing developers, primarily the Moscow Affordable Housing Trust and the local chapter of Habitat for Humanity to discuss how these funds could be utilized to be leveraged against grants, donations, other funding sources to try to help support the construction of affordable housing in the community. And out of that, um, well, we developed this outline, shared it with them at that meeting, uh, of which they were very supportive um, and felt that this, this was a, a program that they could take advantage of to, to further affordable housing in the community. Uh, so we have provided an outline to review today. Uh, we wanted to kind of walk, walk through it to make sure it's consistent with what the council was hoping to achieve uh, with the program of, of trying to promote affordable housing. Um, outline identifies who are the eligible organizations that could potentially be recipients of the grants, how the funds would be utilized, um, the qualifications of home buyers in order to be able to participate in the program, as well as any ongoing housing affordability requirements. So I'll kind of walk through those uh, in detail. So at the time, this was what we discussed uh, at that time prior to the budget being formulated, is that the city would set a target or a goal of allocating 30 or 40,000 a year uh, per fiscal year for the affordable home ownership grant program. So the 30,000 that was allocated was in the range that we were discussing at that point in time. Um, eligible organizations to make applications for these funds would be nonprofit housing developers. So 501c3s uh, that are primarily uh, focused upon the purpose of providing affordable housing. So we probably, there's only two that I am aware of right now. We're the two partners that we met with early on, including the Trust and Habitat for Humanity. Um, we would have a annual application process opened up at the beginning of the fiscal year. Uh, it would be first come, first served basis until the annual allocation had been exhausted. The, initially, we're looking at a maximum grant, grant award of 10000 per housing unit. It's, it's you know, we, we, you want to have a large enough award that actually has a substantive impact and then can be utilized to leverage other grant funding sources. It also is in the range of the building permit utility connection fees for a single family dwelling. So 10,000 was kind of what we were targeting as what we would, um, as a maximum grant award to a housing unit. Um, unless specified otherwise, these grants would be on a reimbursement basis. So we're not gonna advance money. Uh, we want to verify that the home meets the standards of affordability, the buyer meets qualifications for uh, income levels. And so specifically the trust, they go through all that documentation process prior to closing to satisfy their grantor. So we would just kind of fall in line with that, with that effort. Uh, so essentially our payment would happen 30 days after or, or within 30 days of notice of the property closing. And um, the trust has the ability to float funds like that. Um, and lenders can, they work with, uh, could, could accommodate that process. Uh, the grant award, so we would kind of first get an allocation because then they need to go find a home to construct, a qualifying buyer, and put the deal together. And essentially that grant award would be effective for 12 months from date of approval. If for some reason it doesn't come together, then that money would not be expended. The grant award would expire and they can make an application in the next upcoming year cycle. Uh, certainly we're looking at affordable home ownership opportunities, which is a focus. So primarily we're looking at detached single family, attached single family in a townhome type configuration, or could be condominium units if it's a more economical way to build affordable housing. So um, really all of the different forms of ownership opportunities. Um, so we're really not, not only limiting it to detached single family dwelling. The trust has done townhouse twin home type development as, as a way to economize land use. Um, so we would anticipate that potentially moving forward as well. Uh, we're really targeting a buyer who has a household income of 80% or less of the AMI, the annual area median income as published by HUD. So we want, that's a minimum qualification. That is typically the, 
a range that, that uh, the trust is working with, typically between that 50 to 80 percent AMI, <clears throat> usually 60 to 80 to get a buyer to qualify. Uh, the housing unit, we also want to make sure that that's affordable. Um, so the home sale price cannot, ex cannot exceed what's deemed to be affordable for a family of three based on 70 percent of the AMI household income. Again, we're trying to create a little bit of not pushing that home to the very limit of affordability to have a little bit of flexibility. Um, but traditionally, you know, that affordability is, is viewed as being 30% of your uh, gross income. And the, or, and this is kind of a, one of the following measures, the other option is the annual mortgage payment amount, inclusive principal interest taxes, private mortgage and homeowners insurance, may not exceed 35% of the 70% AMI household income. And 35 is at the top range, but 70% kind of brings that income down a little bit. Uh, so again, we want to make sure that what's being constructed is affordable based on uh, area incomes. Uh, the housing units are required to be owner occupied. And the grant recipients need to ensure somehow, and there's two options, that the grant award or the subsidy that's being provided by the city um, will either stay with the home or will be recaptured on some future sale. And that's one thing that Habitat has struggled with. They kind of have a forgiven second, you know, a forgivable second mortgage that over 10 years goes away. And essentially the buyer has a windfall then at that point in time when they sell. Uh, the trust, as they've shifted into the land trust model, they have a resale formula that limits the uh, price appreciation of the home so that it remains afford affordable over time. So um, we, they need to have either a proposed retention or recapture obligation uh, in perpetuity and subject to the city's review and approval. Um, retention will be a deed restriction that, that limits the future home resale amount to retain affordability as well as to ensure that the future buyers meet the same qualifications of uh, household income. Uh, that's the vehicle that the trust utilizes. Um, grant recovery is another option if for some reason there's a project or a developer that doesn't wish to do um, retention, then recovery is the other opportunity where essentially the this, this city has a financial interest lien that secures the amount of that contribution. And on future sale, essentially we recover those monies and they can be redistributed into the program. Uh, the Moscow Affordable Fair and Affordable Housing Commission has, has reviewed the outline of the program and is supportive. Uh, staff want to bring this forward to the council to ensure that it does again meet your goals and objectives for this effort. And if it does, then we'll work on formalizing it by resolution at a future meeting. But we wanted to kind of walk through the outline and make sure it was in keeping with the council's intent. Thank you. I have one question. Yes. And that is, um, there was a slide that talked about, I, I believe it said first come first serve kind of concept. Right. Um, I had a question about that because at some point it seemed to me that maybe the first proposal may not be the best proposal and do we wait till we get a couple of them in there and select the best versus people in an order so that people are like okay so we can actually have some kind of control over the first proposal and i'm anticipating you know the, the two eligible entities are going to be either habitat or the trust and they're going to say we want to build one home and receive a ten thousand dollar allocation mm -hmm. uh, we're probably not going to know details about it other than they know that future home and that home buyer have to meet all those qualifications of the program but I don't know that we're going to get a, a specific proposal other than uh, Nils would like to build two homes in Paradise View subdivision that they've developed. And that's probably going to be the extent of what we know. So there right. may not be a lot of information to evaluate them okay. against. It was helpful. I, somehow that this idea that are they supposed to be working on it now and then when the deadline, when the date starts, you're supposed to have submitted all this paperwork. And I thought, hmm, I don't know if that's really going to. They're yeah. probably going to need to have a, a lot identified. Okay. And they're going to need to be able to start construction and wrap that up hopefully in a nine month time period. And, and maybe we should look at I mean, potentially that should be 18 months. Um, the goal was not to have it hang out there in perpetuity, but it, since we're post closure for the reimbursement, it may be that they have to at least commence construction within that 12 month period and maybe yeah, complete mm -hmm. it within 18 is maybe, maybe how we should when line it out. Um, because 12 months could potentially be tight. You have the trust that has probably 14 lots now ready to go, so they can start construction. And, and if they just get our commitment, they can leverage that with other granting agencies, get funding to build the homes. What can be challenging for them is to qualify buyers. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that could be the time that, or maybe we do 12 months and subject and allow a six month extension upon request if they're 
made a good faith effort. The home's constructed. The buyer they had lined up for the home couldn't qualify, and now they're trying to qualify a second buyer that we could we could add another six month extension just in case it didn't come together in 12 months. But I think it should in that 12 to 14 months, it should be able to pull it together. Yeah, I like being able to give them a little wiggle room just because whether, I mean, little things can go sideways that take up two to three months, yeah. so. You the other question, question I have is, is that, say for instance, Habitat for Humanity puts in a request and the trust puts in a request and that's $20,000 and there's 10 left. Does that 10 roll into the next year? That's up to the council to decide. So, th so this is an annual appropriation. You've appropriated 30000 but it's not like a capital fund. It's not going to stay there unless you reappropriate it next mm -hmm. year yeah. or give, okay. you know, give staff direction. That we, want, we want that to continue to, to build. Um, Habitat may not immediately be able to take advantage of this because they, they currently do not have the subsidy recapture retention provision in their, in their program, but other chapters have. And so they are trying to learn from them. Uh, they're working on it internally. They may have it actually in place by now. We haven't spoken for, for now probably six months. Um, so initially they thought early on they may not be able to, and, and maybe we would need to go to a lottery system if we see a lot of demand. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if the trust comes in and takes all three um, and then nobody else can participate, we may want to consider going to a lottery in the future. We just weren't sure that there would be enough Habitat has a very difficult time finding um, homes, lots in so, Moscow. Yeah, which is the only reason I sat there and I thought I had a question about this first come first serve. If we do want to try and help something like Habitat and they may need a little more time, it would be unfortunate to give all three to the trust if Habitat is just on the edge of getting it. And you know, they internally were talking about how they would share and coordinate and yeah, communicate. Yeah, but anyway, and, I, and I actually how Habitat and first come trust may actually co-develop projects. Habitat can provide some of the material labor and, and the trust can also bring some grant funding to bear. So it really is kind of a partnership, I think, I see it for them in the future. Which, if that's the case, which I think is a great idea, I would just delete the slide that said first come, first serve. That's the only thing I would have put in there. Just um, Somehow we have to have a criteria for yep. selection. Yeah. And so it's either going to be random lottery or first come, first serve. serve. Okay, um, I hear you. They were okay with it to start with. It's yeah. something that we can modify, we can adjust in the future okay. as we see potential demand. I hope we get enough demand that yeah. we are challenged to put more money in it. Because I looked at that and thought, oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's only three houses a year. And that, that bothers me. So I hope we get more demand. My question to you is, do we limit ourselves by saying specifically 501c3? Yes. Okay, but, but do we want to allow C6s or C4s in there? Is there any? I don't know. Okay. To be honest, you know, the, our, my experience has been the 501C3s. That's what the trust has formed. Right. Um, right. But I don't know the other corporate formations of nonprofits to see whether there's any, any, other, any others that exist in town that would. For instance, PEP is a C6. I and know we, there's we, different the, qualifications based on your the right. primary purpose of the organization. For us, housing development, affordable housing development was a 501c3. Is it always a c3? I can do some research to verify that. That's that's been our experience in formation of the trust when we when we created the nonprofit. That was the category of use and the nonprofit category that we had to utilize. And and I'm I'm good with a yes. We do want to limit ourselves to that. I I just it just pinged when when it was shown <laughs> there. So, um, yeah, we okay. can certainly double check that. Yeah, awesome. All right, what's our plan going forward? So just really general direction yeah. today. If this is consistent with mm -hmm. your goals, then we'll, we will take this and formalize it. Um, for, yes. We'll probably need to put it in resolution format for the council to formally yeah. adopt. Uh, so we'll work on that in the next coming weeks. Great. So it won't be this upcoming council meeting, probably the one following. Great, that sounds wonderful. Okay. So Thanks, do I have to say consent? <laughs> um, no, I don't even think okay. it's getting I didn't to think that so, point. but you know, I've got different glasses on, so I just Once we put it in resolution form, it'll come back to committee Thank on you. the way back to committee. Right on. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, reports, David Shot. it looks like you stuck around for the long haul today, sir. Good.
Afternoon. Thank you for having me today. So this is the 2020 weed monitoring report for Lillian Woodworth Otnes Park that I'll refer to as Otnes Park throughout this presentation and Almond Asbury Llewellyn Park I'll refer to as AAL Park throughout this presentation. <laughs> So beginning in April of 2019, the Parks and Recreation Department uh, began general observations and established photo points at Otnes and AAL Park uh, to monitor weeds within par uh, each of these parks. Um, both parks have been pesticide free since April of 2019. Uh, overall, our findings found uh, in 2019 a slight increase in weeds and a slight increase in stamp staff time to control weeds through mechanical means. After the 2019 season, uh, parks at that time recommended monitoring both pilot programs for both parks into 2020. Uh, so our results for 2020. Uh, overall, uh, staff time to mechanically control weeds in both parks uh, increased from 8.5 hours in 2019 to 14.5 hours in 2020. With the exception of uh, Canada Thistle and the turf area of Otnes Park, weeds overall were increasing. So uh, of particular note, uh, we did see an uh, increase in field bindweed at Otnes Park, and we did see uh, first observation of field bindweed at AAL Park, uh, which was a little concerning. Uh, another concern was the rock planter areas at Otnes Park. Um, uh, these planters have become inundated with unwanted vegetation uh, that's uh, persistent uh, after string trimming. So. Uh, this is just out of the, the weed uh, monitoring report in 2020, just some of the diagrams here. A uh, particular note, um, and I'm not sure why this happened, but in the turf area of Otnes Park, uh, Canada Thistle, we were seeing some of that. It kind of planed out, and then I wasn't seeing it for the rest of the summer last year. I think uh, that might just have to be due to uh, good, healthy turf. I uh, choked it out. Um, the rest of it's uh, kind of a lot of clover, not necessarily a weed, but it wasn't turf, so I was recording that. Uh, dandelions, you see kind of the spring, spring bloom, and then they kind of plane off. That's pretty typical. So in the creek area, again, uh, Canada thistle was just consistent throughout the whole time as moderate. Clover was pretty consistent. Dandelions had a, had a couple little spikes. Um, the field bindweed uh, in the creek area did go into the heavy category and remained. Uh, the tree lawn area, so this is the area between the sidewalk and the uh, back of the curb. Um, clover, uh, pretty consistent. Dandelions, again, up in the spring, kind of planed out, a little, little flash towards the fall. So, uh, AAL Park in the turf area, uh, Canada Thistle uh, went from moderate all the way up into heavy. Uh, clover uh, increased as well. As we noted, uh, the field bindweed in August and September, we did observe that at that time for the first time. Dandelions, uh, typical kind of a spring onslaught, and then it kind of planed out. So. This just represents uh, the staff time we, we had taken. So the top chart being 2020, 14.5 hours. This is increased additional hours of staff to control weeds out there outside of their normal uh, mowing, trimming, things of that nature. So, uh, and then 2019, we were at eight and a half additional hours. So, As a parks professional, uh, especially with the top two pictures, uh, that's what a rock planter looks like after it's been string trimmed. So. Uh, the vegetation is just persistent in there, and so I don't like to see that. Uh, the other one's a planter around the sign. It's hard to see in the picture, but we'd have a, a field bindweed kind of making its way up here. Uh, staff did hand pull all this unwanted vegetation out of there. So at the time of writing of this report, and this is a little bit dated, uh, I think there was still some snow on the ground, but um, I was thinking what our recommendations would be for this uh, year. And so at that time, I was going to recommend suspending the weed monitoring program and resume limited pesticide applications in low traffic areas at Otnes Park. So uh, the turf area that seemed to be in pretty good shape and tree lawn remained pesticide free until unwanted weeds were observed or became a nuisance. Um, I was going to recommend uh, treating uh, areas, the creek, uh, the, the planters around the sign, kind of these low use areas, uh, the rock planters, to get rid of that unwanted vegetation. And then we have a planter around uh, some poplar trees on the park as well. Um, and then I was planning on recommending resuming pesticide applications at AL Park based on the increase in Canada thistle in the turf area and the observation of field bindweed. Uh, these are both uh, on the Department of Agriculture noxious weed list. So that's what I was planning to do at the time of the writing of this report. And then we started kind of spitballing a little bit. And 
this is what I'm recommending or I'd recommended to SEC and our Parks and Recreation Commission is to take what we learned in these pilot programs in 2019 and 2020 and apply it and apply it to a new pilot program. So what I'd like to do is designate one park per calendar year to be pesticide free, excluding fertilizer. Um, this would be selected by staff and communicated to the Sustainable Environment Commission and the Parks and, Rec Commission, Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, this would rotate on an annual basis. It would include a playground. It would include some form of monitoring. Um, and this would give residents and visitors with a pesticide sensitivities a park option that would rotate around each year. So uh, this fits with our uh, 2019 updated Parks and Recreation Master Plan to reduce pesticides. Um, the thought being, weeds are cumulative. So the longer you don't treat them year after year after year after year, you're getting more into a Instead of a maintenance, you're getting more and more into a project. And so by rotating a park each year, it gives the public an option that's pesticide free, but it gives us a chance to catch up the following year. And so um, I've seen this uh, a few times in the past with some of the other areas, uh, programs I've worked with as well. So I would note this does exclude East City Park, um, primarily because of our preventative treatments for Dutch Elm disease. Um, Gormley Park would be part of that now as well. Um, Euler Fields and Mountain View School District Community Play Fields. These are highly used active play fields. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Both of these were fighting fairy rings right now, and so I don't want to uh, take away the, the ability to, to, to treat for that. So, so our recommendation uh, we brought forward to the SEC and the Parks and Recreation Commission would be create a pesticide-free park each year beginning in 2022. Uh, July 20th, uh, the Sustainable Environment Commission uh, recommended approval of this, and then I brought this to the July 2021 meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission, which they also recommended approval. And so with that, um, I take any questions or comments, but we'd like to move forward next calendar year with this new pilot program for a pesticide-free park each year. Questions? So excluding those three parks that we had on there, or two, um, how many other parks are there? Oh gosh, I should know that right off the top of my head. Neighborhood to probably 15 to 18 developed okay. parks. So of them, yeah, there's a lot of them. Does that mean like once every 15 years somebody becomes pesticide free? Yeah, it'd be rotate through. <coughs> so. And if, and that we're not stuck with that system, if it's actually working pretty well, we may actually move up and do two parks. Yeah, and that was brought up at our Parks and Recreation Commission <coughs> meeting as well. Is, and that's that monitoring piece we'll look at. It's like, hey, are we seeing this? Maybe we go two years on a park. Maybe we can do two parks, but I'd like to start with one to kind of yeah, just see it how it sense. goes. Right. Sounds like a good idea. The pesticides that you're using right now, how long are they, I don't know the right terminology, how long are they staying in the ground? Like, so you do, you leave one off a year, I don't know, is that going to still be safe for people rolling around in the ground and the dogs eating the grass and all that stuff? Or? Councilor Kelly, that's a great question. And it really depends. Um, the pesticides we use are kind of three categories, a pre-emergent, a broadleaf that we'd use in the turf areas, or a non-selective that we'd use in the planters. If you read through the pesticide label that our staff's all licensed to apply these pesticides, generally, generally most of the stuff we use is uh, re-entry is when spray is dry and so uh, they don't typically have a long residual uh, in the soil um, pesticides ideally do what they need to do and then they're gone and so um, we don't see the old DET you know around for 50 years and all aspects of the um, most of the stuff's um, fairly gets the job done and, and, and it's kind of gone We use Roundup. Uh, not that specific brown brand name, but yes, we do use it, the active ingredient. Is what you need to look for mm -hmm. the gly glycophosphate. Yep. Um, there's a lot of different names for it, but the active ingredient is what you're looking for. And yes, we do use that. It, it's currently Glystar Plus is the brand we're using right now. So. Well, I really like that you're looking for alternatives to this, and uh, I like that you were willing to come up with a whole different plan. I love that you said I was planning to do option one. Now we want to look at this. Um, I'm encouraged that those two organizations were in favor of it. I know that they often offer a lot of opinions, so that makes me happy that they're good with this. So, I, so I agree with well. my no, no, no. I agree my with your with my cohorts here. I think um, I would like us to maybe 
I will never come to the side of thinking field bindweed is a good experience for anyone. Um, but I do think that clover has a use. Yeah. Right. And so, so um, we may find that we like that. I, I'm being semi-sarcastic about the whole thing, but I do think that the rotation once every 15 years is better than continual use on there. And yeah. the option of, you know, no, I'm not going to go to East City, I'm going to go to AAL Park because it's pesticide-free is a good option to have for our citizens. Yep. So... I did all that with respect to clover because I do think having had lots of kids that play and they love that clover and so I'm not sure yeah. that I think of that as such a bad weed. Just to clarify with the <laughs> clover, when I first put the 2019 <laughs> together, yeah, I, totally I was did. just recording anything that wasn't <laughs> turf. Uh, clover actually has a lot of benefits for the soil. In fact, out at Harvest Park, we're putting down cover crops that are a large portion exactly. of clover just for it, its cumulative good effects for the soil. So I was recording it, not necessarily <laughs> it was a bad thing, it just wasn't turf. I was sure. making fun That's of my yard, right. too, is what I was doing. And I didn't know that fairy rings were bad either, but... I've got one of those. So, thank you. Yeah, that thank sounds you. great. Thank you. Um, any staff reports? All right. Shall we adjourn? We shall adjourn. I say we do. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.